I made a million dollars doing magic shows by the time I was 21 years old. I was bankrupt by 22. It led me to ask questions like, how did I get tricked into believing these things that I believe? These lies, essentially, that I thought life was all about. That's an ironic question to ask when you have been trained on how to trick people for a living. and welcome to the Christy Wright Show. I'm so excited because today we are talking about how to get excited about life again. Yeah, that seems pretty basic, but sometimes we can just get bored. And then I got to sit down and have an awesome conversation with Harris III. He is an illusionist, an entrepreneur, an author, a speaker, and a really smart guy when it comes to wonder and how we all should want wonder and how to get it back in our lives, and we're gonna talk about that. But first, let's talk about how to get excited about life again. Now, I wanna give you an example. When I started dating my now husband, Matt, y'all, everything was exciting. Like, going to get ice cream was exciting. Just riding in the car with him was exciting. We would train for a race, and it was exciting. Everything was so new. You're in love. It's so fun. I remember I would be at dinner with my girlfriends, and they'd be like, how's it going with Matt? I'm like, it's so great. Like, the other day, we were riding in this car, and like, we both looked and saw this tree, and like, we looked at it, like, we both knew, like, that's, and they're like, that's not a story. That's not even a story. You're talking about things that don't even make any kind of sense, but when you are in love, Everything is a story. Everything is exciting. Everything is amazing. You are filled with wonder. And I remember when Matt and I got engaged and we started premarital counseling, our counselor said something to us that has stuck with me forever. She said, if you're not careful, life will become business. Marriage will become business. I know it's hard to imagine that right now because you're young and in love and there's butterflies and unicorns and rainbows everywhere you go. But one day you'll look up and your marriage is just a business. Hey, you got the dry cleaning? Who's making lunches? Are you taking the kids to soccer? Are you picking up him? I'll pick up her. We're going here. Don't forget we've got a dentist appointment. Yeah, I'll I'll see you on Friday for the parent-teacher conference. Business. Transactions. Appointments, errands, a lot of doing, not a lot of fun. A lot of going through the motions and getting things done and checking off tasks on a to-do list and showing up for appointments on your calendar and not a lot of enjoyment of this one life that we've been given. If we're not careful, life will just become business. And I think as we get older, And certainly we get busier and we get more responsibility. A little at a time, over time, our life does become business. We're kind of sleepwalking through life, not particularly excited, not particularly full of wonder or joy or even enjoyment of this one life we've been given. We're just checking boxes and showing up for appointments on our calendar. We're kind of sleepwalking, just going through the motions. So I wanna encourage you today. There are actually things that you can do to break this cycle. There are things that you can do to make life fun again, to enjoy your life, to be filled with wonder and fun and enjoyment of this one life you've been given. So I wanna give you three practical things that you can do to help you break out of the boredom you might be feeling and actually have some fun again, to get excited about your life again. The first thing that I want you to do is figure out why you feel this way. Sometimes, because it happens so gradually and so incrementally over time, we never stop to question if that's even okay. We just accept this is how normal grownups live. We don't even question if there's something more for us in this life. It's like Jack Nicholson in the movie, is this as good as it gets? And I wanna tell you, when you stop to identify why you've been feeling that way, What's the source of your discontentment? What's the source of your frustration? Where where did you lose the joy? Where did the fun get sucked out of your life? When you can stop and identify the sources, then you're on your way to fixing them. So ask yourself, why are you bored? Why are you overwhelmed? Why are you frustrated or discontent? Maybe for you, it's the fact that your calendar is too full. You can't enjoy anything because you're rushing from thing to thing to thing to thing. 
You don't even have time to sleep or breathe or finish drying your hair. You're putting makeup on in the car and you're just trying to get to the next thing. Well, you're not gonna have a lot of fun. Fun happens in the margins. Fun happens when you have breathing room. Fun happens when you can relax. Take a minute. So maybe for you, your calendar is just too full. Last year, you had a clean slate and things were cleared off with COVID and the pandemic, but a little bit at a time, you have refilled your calendar and you're running and gunning all over again and you're tired and you're not having any fun and you're not enjoying your life. Maybe that's it for you. Maybe for you, it's a particularly hard season of life. Like you have little kids and you are just about to lose your mind at having to do laundry and having to do dishes and all of the daily chores that just suck the life out of life because they will. Maybe it's a really hard season of life at work. Maybe it's a really hard season of life in a particular relationship with a parent or in-law or even in your marriage or with a child. And that hard season has sucked the joy out of your life. Maybe it's something else. But when you stop to identify why you've been feeling this way, you're able to actually do something about it. So the first practical thing you can do to stop going through the motions and start having fun again is to figure out why you're not having any fun in the first place. Now, the second one is the next logical step after you figure out what the problem is, come up with a solution for that. I'll give you an example. Just last week, I went through my calendar and looked ahead and I just started canceling things. I started canceling things I didn't have to go to, things I didn't want to go to, things that were not a priority for our family that had just begun to fill up our lives. And y'all, after I canceled those things and after I marked them off the calendar, deleted them, I felt so much freer. I felt so much lighter. I felt like, okay, I've got some breathing room. You know, there's another area of my life in a particular relationship that I have been working really hard with one of my kids to improve because I know this is a really tough season with him. And I had a conversation last week that I'm not kidding you, set me free. I realized, and this person helped me realize, this is a season. He's not gonna be like this forever. It's not gonna be this hard forever. This is a season with my child. And when I realize it's a season with my child, I can identify that the pressure is off. The pressure I had been feeling to figure it all out and control everything and and predict the future of how it's all gonna go is off. It's just a season. It's a hard season. But it doesn't have to suck the joy out of life. When I take the pressure off, I take my child out from under the microscope and take the pressure off of myself to figure it all out and fix it all, I can enjoy my child and my life with him so much more. So after you figure out what's been making you feel stressed and bored or discontent in your life, the second step is to come up with a solution for it. Maybe it's clearing your calendar. Maybe it's going to a counselor. Maybe it's something else entirely. But come up with potential solutions for those things. Now, the third thing that you can do to break the boredom and start to have fun in your life again is to do something new. Now, I wanna give you some examples. There are lots of different ways to do something new. Maybe you do something weird, like something you've never done before, something super odd. I'll tell you, in the winter, with three kids age six and under in the house when it's cold and you can't be outside as much, we get real creative. Like we do really weird activities with our kids. I think I've used this example before, but I remember last winter, my kids were driving me crazy. And I was like, guys, I've got a new game. They're like, what is it? Like it just broke them out of them bickering and fighting over who knows what puzzle piece or whatever it was. I said, we're gonna do a race in mixing bowls. Everybody get a mixing bowl. Sit your booty in the mixing bowl. We're gonna do Olympic mixing bowl races across the kitchen. And I start running and pushing. As a bonus, I got a workout because that is not really restful activity for a mom. But we just did something weird. And we laughed and they're falling out of the mixing bowls and they're swapping mixing bowls. Then we're making an obstacle course around the house. Just do something weird to bring fun in your life and break the boredom. Maybe you do something spontaneous. You get home from work and instead of just going through the motions of did you do your homework and where's your backpack and now we've got to cook dinner and now we've got to do baths and now we've got to sit in front of the TV for five seconds while we clean the kitchen and then we go upstairs. Instead of all the usual routine, maybe you're like, hey, 
everybody pile in the car. We're going to eat at a restaurant tonight. We're going to sit outside on the patio. When you do something spontaneous, it injects energy and fun into your life because you break the routine. You break the boredom of the predictable day-to-day grind you're so used to. So maybe you do something weird. Maybe you do something spontaneous. Maybe you do something hard. You know hard things can be good things? Maybe you sign up to run a 5K. Or maybe instead of date night with your spouse, you guys decide to go to one of those ropes course things. Or maybe an escape room where you have to work together. (laughs) That could be good or bad, depending on how that turns out for you. (laughs) But you just do something hard. Do something challenging. Do something new. Maybe for you, It's as simple as trying a new activity that's different. Instead of hanging out with your girlfriends where you guys all go to dinner like you always do, maybe you do one of those sips and strokes where you paint a canvas while you have a glass of wine. Maybe you do something else. When you do something new, from scavenger hunts to mixing bowl races to ropes courses or just doing your homework outside at the park, You inject fun into your life and you break through the boredom of the day-to-day grind. When you figure out why you've been feeling bored in the first place, when you come up with solutions for those things and when you do something new, you will be excited about your life again. You will have a childlike excitement and wonder even though you're a grown up with real responsibilities. You know, I love the verse in Matthew 19, 14 where it says, let the little children come to me the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Jesus asks us to be like little children, to have wonder, to have faith, and to have a childlike excitement about our lives. I want that, don't you? When you do these things, you can be excited about your life again. We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org. We absolutely believe in it. All right, y'all, I'm so excited because I get to hang out with my new friend, entrepreneur, speaker, best-selling author, illusionist, what do you not do, Harris the Third. Thanks for being uh, here. Thank you. It feels inclusive of a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You are have lots of talents, lots of interests, but I'm so excited because when I was uh, researching about what you do and your work, and so many people speak so highly of you, um, you have some really fascinating interests, but also even the topics you cover. So just to kick it off, Tell our audience a little bit about what you do, and then we'll dig into your book and a little bit of your story. Oh, goodness. I mean, it's so many things, but at the heart of it all is the experience of magic. Okay. And what's interesting is I think of magic differently than most people think of magic when they hear about someone like me. Yeah. Historically, I've made most of my living as an illusionist, and uh-huh. so I kind of come into most of my perspectives from the background of someone who spent literally most of their lives traveling the world doing what you would call a magic show. Uh-huh. But somewhere along the way, realized that it wasn't really magic, which is ironic to me because you look at it and call it magic. But deep down, we all know it's totally fake. They're just mm-hmm. tricks. I don't have any sort of supernatural powers. Right. Um, but then we realize that magic isn't necessarily what we see a magician do on stage. It's that sense of wonder that we mm. feel in response to something that we come in contact with that feels mysterious or and previously assumed would be impossible. And I thought, well, man, if I can make people feel that sense of wonder, then that means anybody can do that, not just magicians. So you create magic through this show and the work that you do. Um, All the people behind the cameras and the microphones right now, they're all creating magic. We can all live a magical life. That is, that's so interesting, your perspective on that. Because even the idea, the topic of wonder, I think it sounds like one of those things like, yeah, I want that. Like you see kids and like, and how childlike and how innocent and how excited mm-hmm. they get. And as adults, we lose that, you know, and we just kind of go through the motions and we, the day-to-day schedule and commitments. And I love how you are inviting people into a different experience of their life where wonder is a piece of it and possibilities are limitless and you can have that magic as you describe. So, so for you, the background in being an illusionist is kind of what set you on this path. Yeah. 
since you've now gone on this path, what have you learned about how wonder affects our lives? Because now you're mm. taking it a whole new angle. So yeah. what have you learned for yourself and what are you? It's another long list. Yeah. It's like I've failed so much, therefore I have learned so much, which is probably why I'm so many things when you name off that yeah, yeah, list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I made a million dollars doing magic shows by the time I was 21 years old. Wow. And that's a pretty crazy experience for a lot of people. Um, the other part of that story is that I was bankrupt by 22. Wow. And just, you know, being in this studio and all the things that you guys are involved with, it's it's a— uh, it's not an unfamiliar story, right, right? Right. And it's interesting when you're when you're 21 and you become a millionaire, and then when you go bankrupt, it forces you to take a step back and go, "How did this happen? How right. in the world did I go from this to this?" And for me, it led me to ask questions like, "How did I get tricked into believing these things that I believe? These lies, essentially, that I thought life was all about." And that's an ironic question to ask when you have been trained on how to trick people for a living. How did I get tricked into believing these things? And I really noticed that there were these sort of principles of deception that were universal. And the same way that I trick someone in a magic show is really the same way that we're all tricked into believing anything that isn't true. And I thought, well, gosh, I have the greatest tool in the world to teach people how they get led to believe the things that they believe. And that's what we think magicians are really about. But as I got further into my journey, I realized it's not about tricking people, but there is this sort of counterfeit version of life that we settle for that gets sold to us. How do we get back to what is real? And I realized that most people don't believe in what is real. So when I throw out a word like magic, people sort of roll their eyes in cynicism and they're like, magic, like I'll believe in that when I see it. Mm -hmm. Roald Dahl famously said, those who don't believe in magic will never find it. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have to believe in magic before you're able to see it. And so there's magic all around us, sometimes right in front of our eyes. We just, we have forgotten how to believe in it and mm -hmm. therefore we're blinded to it. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't take much more than a few magic tricks to show that seeing is not believing. So a lot of us go, well, how do I believe? Is it, do I look around? Do I look harder? Do I open my eyes a little bit wider? That's not really it either. Seeing isn't believing. But what the science confirms, and I talk a lot about this in the book, is that believing is actually seeing. Mm -hmm. Seeing is not believing, but believing is seeing. Mm -hmm. And when people hear me say that, you know, cynicism kicks in, and it gets, feels a little woo-woo and yeah, ragey yeah, yeah. and magical, and they're like, so I have to believe in something, and I just close my eyes, and then I wish for it, and it mas manifests yeah. itself? That's not it either. You know, if you're looking for a creative solution to a problem that you're trying to solve, for example, the belief in that solution doesn't mean that you found it yet. But the belief that a solution could potentially exist, it what, it's what gives you permission to go explore it and right. eventually find it. Right. And wonder is essential to that process. Mm. So why do I say all that about your question with wonder? Wonder is what gives us permission to believe. It is this childlike state where magic is real. And the belief in that magic gives us permission to go explore those possibilities. Mm -hmm. And then we end up realizing that more was possible than we originally thought. Than we thought. I want to come back to that because I think that, that there's so much there. But I want to go back to something you said really quick first before we move on. You said you had been believing lies. Mm -hmm. And something that stuck out to me there is— um, I, I've identified it in my own life as well, lies that hold me back, that type of thing. But I work with women every day. I hear their stories. I, I see this all the time where women are believing lies. Men too. I mean, for certainly everyone. Sure. They're believing lies, but they don't realize it. Mm -hmm. So how did you realize that what you were believing was a lie versus accepting it as truth, which is what I see so often. Like, oh no, this is how it always has to be. Or, oh, this is yeah. the best I can do. Or, oh, I'm not cut out for that. I don't, they, they, they've got a, yeah. excuses for days, <laughs> Harris. And I'm going like, well, that's not true. And yes, you can. And you know, I'm like, yeah. this like Pollyanna cheerleader yeah. in the corner. How how did you realize they were lies to start with? Because that's a huge yeah. aha moment. Yeah, by flipping the wonder switch back on. That's why wonder is so central to everything. We're all searching for something. We just don't know that it's called wonder. Mm. We can't have faith without being in a state of wonder. We can't be creative without being in a state of wonder. We don't have permission to believe in the things we can't see without a state of wonder. And once that wonder switch gets turned back on, it gives us permission to go believe something different. But to take that back to the lies, to more directly answer your question, it has a lot to do with those counterfeits that seem real, mm -hmm. right? Like if you go talk to bank tellers and say, how do you spot a counterfeit bill? What I learned, I was surprised to discover this, that bank tellers are not trained to spot a fake by studying what fake bills look and feel like. They're taught what a real genuine bill looks and feels like in their hands. So they're basically trained in the truth, mm. not in deception. Okay. Look, I, I am what many would consider an expert in deception because I've spent almost 30 years now studying the principles of deception that make magic tricks possible. I know how to fool you as a human being and take advantage of how your senses work. 
if I still find myself regularly tricked and deceived and believing the lies, and I'm a supposed expert in it, right. what is our hope of fighting against the lies? It's to become an expert in the truth. Because when you understand the truth and you have permission to believe it because you're in a state of wonder where that truth is even possibly mm-hmm. true, all of a sudden when you come in contact with the counterfeit, you're kind of like, this doesn't feel mm-hmm. right to me because I know what is actually True. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I love the I love the studying the truth versus studying the counterfeit. Yes. So your book that just came out in October, the Wonder Switch. I know you unpack it in this book, but just how how do you define wonder? Like as you talk about it, I'm like, yes, I want that. Yes, that makes sense. That totally resonates. Wonder feels like this elusive idea, though. <laughs> how do you define it or describe it? And then from there, how do you like? The, what's the premise? Of how do you turn the wonder switch on? Like how, for someone that's going, like, how do I do this? What are, What are you talking about? Yeah, you're asking deep, big questions. I oh, know. Let's have it. I'm here for it. I am here for it. Give us a, Give us our, our two minute version, yeah, so yeah. we can keep going. I mean, how do I define it? Is it's a childlike state in which we have permission to believe in a story that we have yet to see. Okay. So when someone like you regularly through this show introduces new possibilities mm-hmm. to people. Their cynicism, which is kind of one of the opposites of wonder, right. has a tendency to push back against that story of possibility. Yeah, I right? see that. Yeah. I, I hear you when you do that. I yeah. get those comments. Yep. Thank so, you for those. So when there's a lack of wonder and you see those comments, that is responded. Even if that's outside of their conscious awareness, their subconscious is going, nope, I will believe in that when I see it. Mm-hmm. So wonder is essential to the process of moving from living as if seeing is believing to putting believing before what we see, the, that what we believe quite literally has the power to change what we see. Okay. So how do we get back to that space of wonder? Well, we have to look at the stories we tell ourselves. So much of this book, even though it's about wonder, is about the stories that we tell ourselves. You and I as human beings are storytelling creatures. Mm-hmm. We walk around all day long telling ourselves stories to make sense of the world, right. to find relevancy in things, to stay safe. Right. And our imagination is simply like a virtual reality storytelling tool for the future, right? Yeah. And so, again, subconsciously, your imagination is fast-forwarding. And every single experience that you're having going, what happens next in this story? What happens next in this story? Which is why if you are, for example, in the backseat of an Uber, your driver starts texting and driving. Your palms might get sweaty. Your heart might start He's going to drive us off the road in a second. Like, I'm I'm ready for it. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. What's happening? That is the work of imagination, Mm. just like creativity is the work of imagination. Mm. It's just a different type of creativity, right? And so your brain is trying to keep you safe by sending you signals through your nervous system. Hey, get out of the car. This isn't a safe example right now. However, I think worry is a misuse of imagination. Mm -hmm. And so all this time that we spend in worry and anxiety, that is us using our imaginations The position of our wonder switch determines what we use our imagination for. Mm. It is a myth that your imagination is active when you're a child and then you grow up and it sort of fades away. Mm. You just start misusing it to worry and fear. Mm. So to turn the wonder switch back on allows you to examine your imagination. The stories that you are creating in Mm -hmm. your head allows you to sort of take control of that narrative, restore the parts of it that are broken so you can get back to living from a place of wonder. I love that because even as you talk about the things we tell ourselves about our world, our situation, our Uber driver, whatever, I've noticed, um, especially in women I work with, um, I've seen this again and again. We tell ourselves stories about ourselves yes. all the time. Yes. I'm not a fun mom. I'm never going to get married. Yes. I'm never going to get that job. I'm not business-minded. And again and again, I push back on that, you know, the cheerleader in me. And I'm like, says who? You know, go do something fun. You're a fun mom. Says who? Go apply, you know. Yeah. And, and so I think we have we place these labels and limitations on ourselves, and then we live within them. But I love how you are calling people, pushing people outside of that to this place of wonder and saying, when you believe, then you're going to take different actions that then lead to different results. And then guess what? That thing that was impossible yes. actually becomes true. Okay. So I want to ask about personality styles. Okay. So, you know, we're around this place, we're all like all the disc, Myers-Briggs, <laughs> Strengths Finders, Enneagram, it doesn't matter what you like. But I'm always fascinated at how some of the topics I talk about are played out in different personality styles. Mm-hmm. Me and my husband— are complete opposites, like most <laughs> couples. Wonder, I feel like, comes just real easy for me here. As sure. I'm like, oh, what could we this? And how? what about this? And I've got 100 yeah. ideas a day. And my husband is like, what are the facts? What are the research? <laughs> Where, where's the financial statement? Where's the budget? No, I pick on my husband, but I think it's true with my yeah. kids. You know, my son Carter, he's like an exact rep- replica of my husband, and he is cautious, and and he knows exactly, like he wants to control everything and see all the numbers and the formulas, and my son Conley's like, wow, at everything. Mm-hmm. Wow, I'm on a tree. Like, it's like, <laughs> it, it comes easy. So what does this look like when you talk about we have— different strengths and weaknesses, sure. different personality styles, however you want to categorize it. Yeah. And what does wonder look like for someone that maybe 
is more analytical, uh-huh. more skeptical. Those are strengths of being analytical and practical. Lord knows Absolutely. Matt keeps me from running off the cliff and spending all of our money. But how do they, How do those personality styles that maybe it's not as natural for them, how do they turn on the wonder switch? How do they engage uh, yes. that childlike faith when, man, their they're wiring is yeah. more practical and skeptical? Yeah. That's just a part of who they are. So much we could talk about this. I'm so glad you asked this question, by the way. You're it's describing hard. my wife and I as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we do entire workshops with companies like oh, this cool. to try to affect their corporate culture because cool. I think there are wow people. And, and how people. And how people, yes. yes. I have talked about this before. Oh, yes, awesome. Awesome. yes, the wow no, people. I should have had people. you write that section no. of the book for me. <laughs> no, so. I think someone shared it with me that probably got it from you. But I said it, it was like it was like years ago someone shared it with me. They probably yeah. heard you. But it's like the wow people are so excited. The how people yes. want to know how. And you see this play out, like you said, in companies, yes. though, too. Okay, so unpack this for us, because you're probably the one they got it from, whoever well, I heard this from. Yeah, so wow people and how. I'm a wow person. Yeah. My wife is a how person. Sounds yes. like it's flip-flop for you and your husband, the same thing. So, you know— How people, so much of this goes back to narrative. So let me rewind for a second. Those lies that you talk about that women are constantly believing and men too, right? I think there's only three of them. I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. I don't belong. Mm -hmm. And I can't. Mm -hmm. Fill in the blank. I can't. Whatever. And almost every other lie falls into one of those three categories. That comes back to their narrative. The personal narrative that they have adopted to be true. And because we are storytelling creatures, those narratives drive all behavior, they drive our thinking, our choices, our worldviews, narrative drives behavior. So for a how person, that I think much of that is sort of part natural gifting mm-hmm. of how they're wired, right. and it's also been shaped okay. by their previous experiences. So in their narrative, that particular narrative has shaped them to believe and place a higher value on the plan, to okay. making sure that all the blanks are filled in so that they can play it safe and nothing bad happens. Because subconsciously, their brain is going, Remember last time? Right. right. Like you're saying, who says? Well, someone said at some right. point, right. you're not going to be a good mom or this mm-hmm, is impossible, mm-hmm. which is why you're repeating that story back to yourself, which is why you have to choose to believe something different to eventually see something different. Mm. But with how people wow people, I think wow people need to be more empathetic to the how people in their lives mm-hmm. to sort of uh, step in and lean in to hold their hand a little bit more instead of just be like, hey, anything's possible. And they'll be like, hey, I could use a plan. It's not that I'm not willing to go along with that. <laughs> right, but right, like, right. Can you tell me what right, the plan is first right. before we jump in? Right. And it's funny, I say the same thing all the time. I, w- I think I would be bankrupt again without my wife being yes. a how person yes. or dead in a ditch somewhere right, because right. I'm like, anything's possible, right? <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> but from her perspective, if I get a good idea, maybe I'm in the shower shampooing my yeah. hair and I'm like, oh, right. This is genius. We're all, I have to tell all of our ideas are. Yeah, for exactly. Sure. <laughs> right. So I'm like, babe, babe, come here. Okay. So what if we? <laughs> and so as a how person, what does she say? There's usually a hand on the hip. Mm-hmm. I don't know why you guys do that, but <laughs> the hand on the hip. Now, how in the world are we going to do that? Yeah. Right. When how is introduced to wow too quickly, it shuts down the creative process. It shuts down wonder. So in your context where you have a healthy team, yeah. which consists of both wow people and sure. how people. And you need both. Yep. You need both. You have to honor the right part. There's a time for wow. There's a time for how. If how people are struggling with wonder and the wonder is being too intimidating, vice versa with the how people, I think have wow meetings and have how meetings. And a lot of times we blend the two together. And you can do this in your family, in your marriage. If there's a time where you're like, man, as soon as I introduce a wow idea, it's being met with how too soon, Mm. then that creative process is being shut down because we don't let wow breathe. Wow. So the simple way to let it breathe is to save meeting number two as a how meeting. Cool. Let meeting number one just be a wow meeting where anything's possible. Dreaming, brainstorming. Yeah. And it's also in your language. So if you're a how person listening to this, which again, you have your set of strengths, wow, people need you. How people need to respond to possibility with open-ended questions like, Mm -hmm. okay, what if this happens? How would you respond to that? Mm -hmm. Which is very different than that won't work. Mm. So question marks instead of periods. Yeah, I love that. I love how practical that is to help people because I think so often we want to honor each other. We know we need each other, but we— bump heads and we are kind of like, you know, fumble around mm-hmm. in meetings. Like you said, it, when you were describing these two meetings, it made me think of even my writing process for the longest time. Like when I started out as a writer, I would try to write and edit at the same time. I would try to create. I'd have on my creative hat and my editing hat at the same time. And you can't create and edit because creativity, everything goes. And editing is only few things go. And and I would get frustrated. None of my ideas would make it through. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I was like, I got to wear two different hats. I'm going to put on my creative hat and anything goes, write it yes. all out. 
Yes. And then switch gears. Yes. Put on my editing hat and let's edit and refine and make it better. But I think to your point, whether it's in the meetings or uh, the focus of the meeting or even writing, whatever, when we try to do both simultaneously, we're killing the ideas before they have time to come to life. Yes. Um, or, you know, we don't let the, the best ideas through. You yeah. Know? It's probably worth noting that I think our current culture creates more how people than wow people. Okay. Like, what do you mean by that? Um, you know, like, well, for example, if I do a magic trick, if I did something that seems impossible to you right now that amazed you, what would your first question for me be? How? Yeah. 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 Where if you saw me do a magic trick for you a hundred years ago, you might have wondered how I did that, but you just would have been fine going, wow, that was amazing. Really? And then you would have walked out of the theater and you would have been like, wow, what's that? Oh, that, they're calling those cars? You would have gone home and picked up a little device and held it to your ear and been like, man, I can talk to someone who isn't even in the yeah. same room with me. We lived in a culture where everything was filled with mystery mm. and wonder. We were constantly amazed by things that felt very magical. But now we have these little devices in our pockets. Yeah. Not only are we in the information age, we have access to the secret to anything. So if you see me do a magic trick or if I perform a magic show That's in a group so of teenagers, yeah. They don't even say how. They immediately pull their phones out of their pockets. They're like, how does he? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And that's because we have sort of been psychologically reconditioned in our modern age to feel uncomfortable mm. with wonder. Mm -hmm. It almost feels threatening and disruptive to the status quo. So when we come in contact with mystery, we feel a responsibility to crush it immediately. Mm. So in a way, not only is our wonder being crushed by the trauma and the experiences in the world around us, but we are actively engaging in crushing our own wonder because we're so uncomfortable with mystery. So we've got to learn how to reverse that order, go back to turning that wonder switch back on. Mm, that's so interesting. It makes me think of even just learning about my husband. He's an Enneagram 5. I'm an Enneagram 8 for the anybody that's into the Enneagram. But one of the things that is a strength of his is he literally knows everything about everything. Like he, like I'm like, will you please go on a trivia show and make us millions of dollars because put this to use. You know everything. I mean, I'm talking like C-level actors from like the 40s. I'm like, how do you know this? Yes. But in in understand, he's he's fascinated and curious, but it's also that is his way to control his environment. Mm -hmm. Is he if he has all the information? For me, it's like aggressiveness. Like, ah, like I'm just gonna like bulldoze through a room. We all have uh -huh. our strengths and weaknesses, but I think all of us have this temptation to know how, to your point, to have all the information because it's available in our phones uh -huh. or the internet, whatever, it's a way to control our world. It's uh -huh. like, well, no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna sneak up on me, surprise me. Like I'm gonna have, I'm gonna control my environment by having uh -huh. all the facts, uh -huh. all the behind the scenes or whatever. This uh -huh. is this is so fascinating. I know that some people are listening to this and they're going, this sounds nice, but like what would be a good starting point? I don't even know, I don't even know how to retrain my brain or how to catch those stories I'm telling myself, some of those stories I've lived with for such a long time. For someone maybe that's like you've you've fanned the flame of some hope in them that mm -hmm. they could be excited about possibilities again, what would be something just really simple they could do this week to start to pay attention to their thoughts yeah. or change how they think about how they're, how they're using their imagination to your point, sure. that type of thing? Yeah. Obviously, I'm using the metaphor as a switch for mm -hmm. wonder. If there's a wonder switch, that means that there's some sort of electricity feeding that switch. And the good news is it just takes a spark. Mm -hmm. uh, in the book, I outline something called the transformation map, and there's some steps back to wonder. And the first one is just a spark. That spark can trigger awe. Mm -hmm. Scientists are now studying positive awe states. Mm -hmm. And what we're discovering is that this state of positive awe, experience of wonder, is so powerful that it shifts the physiology in our bodies. Wow. You living in a state of wonder can decrease chronic inflammation, boost your immune system, decrease stress, increase your empathy, give you the ability to connect with other human beings on a more emotional level. That's just you living in a positive awe state. Wow. Why positive? Well, because awe is the root of the root of the words awesome and the word awful. Yeah. Right? yeah. So you could be like, oh my, I can't believe that she yeah. or he just yeah, yeah. did that, right? That's bad. Uh -huh. We want positive awe states. And so we have to learn to expose ourselves to what I call magic. Magic is awe stimuli. What is the magic in the world? And so much of that is a return to childhood. Mm -hmm. So spending time with children, um, learning to get back into the way that you saw the world when you were a child, getting out in nature. Mm -hmm. These are just the simple practical things. The deeper work is a re-examination of the narrative. If, if you were born with the wonder switch turned on, mm -hmm. the good news is that you're not going to look for something that you've never had. Mm -hmm. It's less of a work of a of addition and finding something to add to your life like wonder and more subtraction. Mm -hmm. If wonder is your natural state because you came into the world believing that magic and therefore seeing it everywhere, then the real work is how do I get rid of what's in the way, what's blocking me, what's blinding me and keeping me from seeing the magic? And that's the difficult inner radical self-inquiry of healing from trauma. Yeah. So the, the person listening who says, I'm not enough, or I don't belong, or I can't be that type of mom, or I can't launch that business I've been dreaming about forever, that narrative didn't happen by accident. Mm. 
We take in four to 5,000 messages a day now in America. Some studies say as many as 10,000. That's 10,000 stories trying to shape your narrative, how you spend your time, how you spend your money. So I'm Not Enough wasn't imagined. That was birthed out of somewhere in your narrative. Something or someone or an experience convinced you you weren't enough. You took it, assumed it was true. It became a part of your narrative, and now that narrative is driving your behavior and belief Mm -hmm. systems. So we have to challenge them. We have to go back and heal from some of those painful parts of our past to correct the story. Yeah, I love that. I love how you just— invite people into more. It doesn't have to just be the day-to-day feeling stuck in those stories and those narratives and just uh, even just being bored in your own life. It's like opening your eyes, turning on the switch to the possibilities that are there. And then it's amazing because I think people will experience a completely different outcome simply because they started by believing and then that led to the actions. Okay, I know people want to know <laughs> where they can get the book and where they can follow you and sure. see everything you're doing and learn about your other work and everything like that. The, the book is switch. everywhere books are sold. Uh, if you want easy to access links, just go to thewonderswitch.com. You can even read the first chapter for free. Um, thewonderswitch.com. Learn all about the book. All of my rest, the rest of my work is found at harristhethird.com. And there's all sorts of opportunities for people to learn in and jump in and start yeah. learning for free through the different things that we're involved in. I love it. The Wonder Switch, the difference between limiting your life and living your dream. This is so good. It's been such a fun conversation. Thanks for coming in. It's thanks for hanging out with us. And thanks for spreading hope to our audience. Yeah, you're welcome. My pleasure. You know, recently on spring break, my husband and I took our boys out of town, just just a little bit uh, further in East Tennessee. And one of the things we did on a rainy day on our vacation is go to an aquarium. Now, I don't know if you guys feel this when you go to aquariums, but whether I go to the zoo, but especially aquariums, I am amazed at how many creatures there are. Like, y'all, there were the weirdest creatures, some of them that had shapes that made no sense. Their eyeballs were in locations that I did not understand. It was absolutely fascinating. Well, of course, we love walking through the aquarium and seeing all the creatures from giant sharks with huge scary teeth to these tiny little things that light up that look like lightning bugs and everything in between. My boys love it because they get to see all of these different things, but I think I love it just as much, if not more, than they do. Because when I walk through an aquarium, the only thing I can think over and over again is, God, you are so creative. Like when you walk through this aquarium and all of these creatures, which are so weird and diverse and and things you've never even seen before or knew about are in front of you on display, you're just amazed. You're in awe, full of wonder at how creative God is. I kept saying it over and over again as we walked through that aquarium to my boys, God is so creative. God is so creative. Look at that and look at that. You know, in that moment, I was faced with God's creativity and I had this pause in my life to focus on it, be filled with wonder about it. But so often, you and I, we go through the motions. We walk through our day, we run from meeting to meeting and task to task, and we miss the wonder, the creativity that's all around us. Of not only everything that God created in the heavens and the earth and his creatures and nature, but even how he's providing for us and protecting us all along the way. We miss it. He's performing miracles all around us. He's taking care of us in big and small ways, and we miss it because we're just busy. Or because we, as a normal, mature, grown-up adult, think, oh, well, what a coincidence that happened. Oh, crazy. Got so lucky. You and I are not lucky. Our God is in control. Our God is creative and powerful and with us all day, every day. And when we slow down, when we turn our eyes and ears and heart to look for those things, we will find them and we will be filled with wonder. I love the verse in Psalm 8, three through four. It says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? When you look at how big this world is, how creative and powerful our God is. It's incredible that not only that he created us and considered us, considers us, but he created all of this for us to enjoy. I think when you and I see him in that, we will be filled with the wonder that we want and the wonder that he created us for. I wanna give you some journal questions to think about as you process this. The first is this, what fills you with wonder? 
maybe it's nature and aquariums and zoos like it is for me, or maybe it's something else entirely. Maybe you see him in situations. Maybe you see him really closely in certain relationships. What fills you with wonder naturally? Write down your answer. Number two, what gets in the way of you being filled with wonder? What gets in the way of you seeing God in everyday things? I'll tell you, for me, it is for sure busyness. When I rush and run around, I'm not really looking for God. I'm just trying to get things done and get to the next thing. What is it for you? What gets in the way of you being filled with wonder and awe at what God has done and is doing in your life? Write down your answer. And number three, what is one thing that you wanna do this week to begin to look for wonder and be filled with wonder? I've given you lots of practical things in this episode today. We had an awesome conversation with Harris III. We're talking all about how you can control the wonder in your life. So what are you gonna do about it? I don't want you to just listen to the show. I want you to actually put it into practice in your life. So what's one thing that you wanna do to take action on this idea of wonder so you can create it in your own life. Write down your answer. All right, I would love to pray for us as we wrap up. God, you are so worthy of our awe and respect. You are worthy of our wonder. Sometimes we get so busy. Sometimes we just wanna be practical grown up. Sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it, but God, would you help us look for you? Would you help us turn our eyes and ears toward you that we may be filled with wonder and awe at what you have done for us and what you are constantly always doing for us? God, let us be like little children. Let us come to you with a childlike faith, with excitement about this life that you have given us, and with wonder. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much for joining me. Of course, you can tune in next week for another new episode of The Christy Wright Show. And as always, for more encouragement on building confidence in yourself and the God that created you, you can visit christywright.com.